It's the holiday season, and Noble Knight's got a brand new code, and this time it's for 10% off. Hey everybody, your old buddy Hambone is here, and I am in the holiday spirit, and so are our friends over at Noble Knight Games. So much so that they've bumped the normal 5% discount code that they give us up to 10%, and this is just in time for the holiday season. So if you're thinking about buying some games or gaming accessories for your friends and family, look no further than noblenight.com. Now, this coupon code is 10% off, and that is good for online or in-store purchases, and it's going to be running from the 25th of November all the way through December 22nd. That's 10% off all purchases online or in-store running from the 25th of November all the way to December 22nd. Now, the code is Vintage RPG, so you want to make sure that you put that in at checkout to get your 10% off. There is a minimum purchase requirement of 5 bucks, but once you get over that 5 bucks, it is 10% off across the board. December 22nd is the last day that you can get stuff for Christmas depending on shipping, so go on to noblenight.com now and put in the code Vintage RPG and get 10% off your purchases from November 25th to December 22nd. And happy holidays from your friends at Vintage RPG and our friends over at Noble Knight Games. This is the Vintage RPG Podcast. Your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs. With your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me as always is the editor-in-chief of Unwinnable.com. His first A to Z book was a monster manual, (laughs) Stu Horvath. (laughs) Fun fact about me, when you're giving me an encyclopedia that is organized A to Z, I almost always read it from Z to A. You do like a challenge. (laughs) And all the fun words start with Z. Yeah. Not really. There's like three Z words that I know. Zebra. Yeah. Zoo. Yeah. Oh, xylophone starts with an X. Yeah. So here we go. <laughs> How are you doing today, Stu? <laughs> Pretty good. So today we are going to do a mini episode on the first edition Monster Manual. It's crazy. I love it. I love it because aesthetically it is so different than the other two books in the original first edition set. Like it actually looks like a kid's coloring book on the outside. Totally. So let me start by asking you, what order do you put the core three books in? Always Dungeon Master Guide first. Interesting. Then Monster Manual, then Player Handbook. All right. So I personally do Player's DM's Monster Manual. That's interesting. Yeah. I guess for me, psychologically, I identify more as a Dungeon Master than a player because more often than not, I'm always the one running the game. Yeah. And as much as I love playing Dungeons and Dragons, and I only became a Dungeon Master by default, it's just always been the case. So no matter what edition... It's always Dungeon Master Guide, Monster Manual, because, of course, I love monsters, and then the Player's Handbook. I think the same way as you, but I think that somewhere in my head, it just got in my head that Player's Books come out first, DM's Books come out second, and Monster Manuals come out third. Oh, so you're attacking it more from the librarian perspective. Yeah. That said, I think it's super interesting that the first book that came out for Advanced Dungeons & Dragons in 1977 was the Monster Manual. That is super, super interesting. Right? I mean, granted, if you're going to hook me on something, definitely lead in with pictures over text. Yeah, and like a book of monsters is like the best thing ever. It's catnip. Yeah, it really is. It's like if you were going to, say, build a trap for me, (laughs) and you have a little box and a little stick holding it up and a little string off to the side, it would definitely be like tacos, a monster manual, and a Coke Zero. (laughs) I'm powerless to stop you. I'm going to note that, and you've just given our listeners very dangerous information. Well, thankfully, they don't know where I live. (laughs) I fear for your safety. Sometimes I do, too, (laughs) Still, I'm very kidnappable. So this is the dividing line between the original white box or wood grain box Dungeons & Dragons and what we have come to know as first edition, which was Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. And it came out in 77. And then it was like a whole year before the Player's Handbook came out in 78. And... 
it was another stretch of time before DM's Guide came out in 79. So this was running parallel to the starter set. So basic D&D, white box D&D is still out okay. and is still being supported. And the basic rule set is also coming out at the same time. Okay. So there's three different flavors of D&D coming out. And of them, the one that is sort of incomplete for a number of years is Advanced Dungeons & Dragons because it just takes so long for them to get all three rule books out. Gotcha. And they kind of were developing the whole system on the fly in the pages of Dragon Magazine. So a lot of the stuff in the Monster Manual, you could have found these monsters being sort of worked out in Dragon before 1977. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons was this known thing that was on the horizon, but it was being made real time in public. And I think that's super interesting. That is. And it's funny to look at the Monster Manual in this iteration more as, say, the sprinkles for the ice cream that goes good on every flavor <laughs> because you do have the three different versions running concurrently. Every version is going to need monsters. Monster Manual is the Jimmies <laughs> that land on the top of your Sunday, if you will. And in the preface, it says specifically that these monsters are for advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Which I always kind of had it in my head that there was sort of a crossover, like you could use them for basic. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from using them for basic, but like they were designed specifically for advanced Dungeons and Dragons. They weren't thinking that people could use this for whatever game they're running because all the systems are slightly different. Interesting. Yeah. It's fun too because this is all pre-internet before even anyone probably had the idea for internet so your thoughts at the time were probably just like all right i yeah this says advanced but this is what this is and this is what this is so unless like you're in the know you're kind of just flying blind yeah like if you're just buying this stuff at a store you just kind of have to figure it out like there's no one to tell you what's right or wrong so you could do whatever you want with the products and I think that's really interesting, too, from where we're at now, where there's like videos and tutorials and you can find out the right way to do it as if there is a right way. You know, right. the more we do this, the more I'm interested in how the approach to play this kind of game has changed. Everything was a lot more nebulous necessarily back then. And I think that people didn't feel constrained by a sense of just needing to do it the right way. It's like, you know, when you're growing up and you're in art class and the art teacher's like, there's no real right way to art. Yeah. Just art. And it's the same way with role-playing games. Yeah, there's no right way to play. All right. I think that you get more out of that from the weirdness of the origins because like they didn't know they had three systems going at the same time like that's dumb looking back like that's like oh god why were you guys doing that basically one of these three different species was going to succeed and the other two were going to get killed off by evolution like that seems obvious looking back on it but at the time they were spending all of this energy on three different systems it's pretty interesting to me because there is that very real old west component to the late 70s and the 80s where it's just like we can just do whatever because there's really nothing that has come before that would set any kind of precedent you know there's no map for this the great thing about gygax back in the day was that he literally for all intents and purposes was a trailblazer because he was just like all right we're gonna do this and we're going for it and then what shook out of it ends up being the products that we have on our bookshelves and our collections that we hold so dear nowadays, and the template for everything that came after it. And the template was built by people either fundamentally misunderstanding what Gary was trying to do or actively just disagreeing with that and doing something else. It's all a reaction to Dungeons & Dragons and Gary Gygax in the early days. Now it's harder to trace, but like those first 10 years, it all is rooted in what he was doing, and then it spreads out. It's a definite clear-cut ripple effect from what he started to where we're at now, which yeah. is pretty cool. And it involves monsters, which I think is just the fact that like there's this super weird thing that starts with monsters. And it really centers D&D on the idea of you go to places and you fight monsters because, you know, it's a monster manual. You got to use them. So let's talk about that monster manual still. So, gosh, this cover, you so nailed it. Like, and I never really thought about it, but it is like a coloring book. I took this cover and it was like the template for how I drew monsters and stuff in my notebook for several years. Like that cross section thing with like tunnels so you could see everything in the 2D side scrolling kind of way. David C. Sutherland III did the cover. I had never thought of him as a very stylistically or technically excellent artist, but he does get something awesome 
you know? He does capture something really special, and it's funny because the original copy that I had actually had a Toys R Us price sticker on it. Ah, that's the best. So it's cool because it reminds you that this was in fact sold in a toy store and it was meant for children that being said the Sutherland cover is interesting because in a lot of ways like I mean I was I was a kid I was growing up they had like bible coloring books that look like <laughs> the very same on the outside where if it didn't say monster manual on top and there was not a centaur and a roper then you could actually probably be like oh yeah this is like the outside of the garden of Eden or something yeah yeah you know and obviously the back side of it is a lot more nefarious Farious. You got that purple worm. Yeah, purple worm. I was always terrified by his design for the troll. It was something about those black eyes and the nose and the screaming countenance. Ugh. See, what I love is the back cover where it just flat out says, hey, there are over 350 <laughs> monsters in this some bitch right here. Yeah. And it's wild because it is a child's book. And it literally lays it out in the front. This book provides a complete alphabetical list of all monsters encountered in the various works which comprise the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons game system. It is an invaluable aid to players and dungeon masters alike. And it gives you an example of what a monster chart looks like. Yeah. And like it's a little kid's book. Yeah. There's nothing else like it in first edition and second edition. Yeah. Because any of the boxes, anything, they all look more like, all right, this is a serious game for adults. But the original monster manual is for all intents and purposes, a child's book. Yeah, I mean, look at that castle in the clouds on the back cover. Like, I drew that a million times in third grade. Independently, I didn't know what the monster manual was. You know, I hadn't seen that yet. It's just something that kids who are obsessed with, you know, fantasy or, and monsters and, and that sort of thing, it's like something that naturally comes out. I think that's the appeal of Sutherland's artwork is that it reminds me of my own doodling. And he manages despite his doodling kind of style, to be really technically excellent every once in a while. The last picture on the Monster Manual where it's a fighter going up against a bugbear, a gargoyle, a naga, and a centipede, which is an odd combination. It really is. But it's also very like random encounter chart of the era. But I love that picture, and it's so clean and tight and not like his weird sketchy drawings in the rest of the manual. Oh, yeah. It is definitely more in line with the rest of the series. Yeah, yeah. I want to take a quick second to shout out Rick Yibinger, who was the original owner of my monster manual. His <laughs> name is written in red Sharpie on the inside cover. I don't have an actual original owner listed on mine, sadly. I actually have a very near mint copy of this monster manual. The pages are so absolutely crisp. And you're right, the artwork inside is very, very good, very sketchy in a lot of ways, and also sketchy in other ways, because if you open up to the page with the Sphinx, you definitely see some nips. <laughs> like, there is a topless Lady Sphinx, yeah. and the girls are out on display, which is kind of funny, because I just made this whole thing about how it's a children's book, and here we got some nipples. Hashtag free the nipple. And of course, you have a whole bunch of Trampier artwork, which I think is an interesting contrast to a lot of the other artists in the book. I feel like he was maybe the most technically competent. I always loved his very woodcut style stuff. He does the lizard man. He does the lich. His lich is one of my all-time favorite drawings of a D&D monster, bar none. Yeah. Bar yeah. none. And... A lot of other artists that I follow now and artists that I like, you almost can see the influence of the Trampier artwork. I follow an artist called Boss Dog who makes the most amazing, very limited edition like t-shirts and clothing and stuff, yeah. but it's very old like D&D style artwork on it with fun slogans like one of death that has a Hawaiian lei on it and he's got a Mai Tai in his hand. This is like no time for you or something <laughs> like crazy stuff, but it's really fun work and you could just see the cascading effect of inspiration from stuff like Dave Trampier's art, the original Monster Manual. Yeah, like there's something about his stuff too that is, I find very of the period while being timeless at the same time. I almost want this art to have been like wood burned. You remember how wood burning was like a thing in the late 70s and early 80s? They made a D&D &D wood burning <laughs> kit Yes. when they started making like weird D&D &D merchandise. But I feel like Trampier's artwork comes out of like this American folk art tradition that wood burning kits spawned from, you know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. There's just like something about it that roots it in the late 70s, early 80s for me. And he's so good. He's amazing. The groaning spirit that he does, the banshee. Ugh. It's just stuff like that you just don't see anymore. Like I love new Dungeons and Dragons art. I love it that it's become so whimsical yet dangerous at the same time. But 
it's really dangerous in first edition. It's really like, you know, this is what monsters look like. There was no like CGI monsters or, you know, even like the special effects were so limited in the 70s and 80s that like what you see is what you got. Like look at the monster in Conan the Destroyer oh, yeah. that he faces in the mirror room yeah. versus, you know, any monster that you see on television nowadays. Like there's a lot more work that had to go into it. And I appreciate that work that they put into books like the Monster Manual and old artwork and monster styles from the 80s and early 70s. And it's funny because I feel like the modern approach to a lot of monsters in terms of like the art direction really feels like film concept art to me. It has like a kind of unfinished quality to it and you have like a real contrasted style between Sutherland and Trampier and there's a couple other artists in here too and it just feels different and varied and you don't know what to expect from any of these monsters well could you imagine when this book came out right now this book that i'm holding in my hands is very very old older than me yeah it's older than me it's 1977 and the fourth edition version i have is from 1979 like the fourth essentially the fourth printing of it but could you imagine them rolling up to an artist and be like okay so you need to draw a gray ooze <laughs> Yeah. And here it is on page 49, and it's just what looks like slime rolling down a flight of stairs. And that's awesome, because it's so subjective. Like, I really wish I knew where that came from. I got to do research on that. There's a very strange preoccupation in early D&D with slimes and oozes. Oh, yeah. Puddings. The black pudding. (laughs) And I'm like, how could anything be so bad if it's named pudding? Yeah. (laughs) Well, let me tell you, it ain't good. And then across the page, number 48, you have a flesh golem, which is a little more in line with, you know, flesh golem. It's Frankenstein. Yeah. There's some things where you don't always have a clear cut idea of what this is. You know, a purple worm. What? A quasit. Yeah. So it's like, well, what is this? And they kind of give you a brief description. You as the artist have to interpret it yourself. Like, this is amazing stuff. They have the freedom to be able to create like this. And then ultimately have your design be the template for everything that's to come. With yeah. some small modifications, but nonetheless, now we know what a closet looks like because of the original Monster Manual. As an artist, you're illustrating these things that are like sort of weird and there's no benchmark for it. And then you also have to be concerned about how you're portraying it to the DM so that they can figure it out. Because like in 1977, I surely don't know what a closet is. You know, I don't know what a beholder is. In 1977, I don't even have Big Trouble in Little China to sort of have like that extra little bit of pop culture context for a beholder. It's just a weird thing. It is definitely a weird thing. You know? And then if you look at the actual beholder in this book... It is a very iconic look and a very iconic design to it. And that said, it doesn't look anything like any Beholder that's come after it. Oh, no. Yeah, it's totally doofy. It is such a, like, goofy... It almost looks happy. You run into a happy Beholder, you know. It's just happy (laughs) to see you because it's going to eat you. Funny thing about the Beholder, it was uh, originally drawn by Tom Wham, who did the Attack of the Snits pull out board games in Dragon Magazine. Awful Green Things from Outer Space. He designed a whole bunch of board games for Dragon Magazine, and he's the guy who did the original Beholder. And knowing that, you can kind of see the connection there. It seems like the Beholder has sprung from the world of awful green things from outer space. Oh, yeah. The Beholder has definitely gotten a glow up in recent (laughs) years. Yeah. As have many of these monsters. And that being said, there's nothing like taking a stroll down memory lane and taking a look at the classics, because everyone comes from somewhere, even Beholders. (laughs) Yeah, I think you should definitely pick this up if you don't have one and kind of just put yourself in the mindset of pretending that all this stuff was new like that you don't know all this stuff that you know about these monsters but just through osmosis because the game is so out there now and just pretend oh yeah absolutely try and figure out what it felt like the first time a player (laughs) met a beholder or any of these monsters that aren't in folklore you know in fact i think that's a great lesson for dungeon masters too it's something that i often teach people when i teach them sales is that when you're doing a sales job and in a lot of ways when you're a dungeon master you hit a point where you get so far away from what you did when you started and you were even new at it that you almost forget what it feels like to be new at a job 
or new at running a game, you often forget what it feels like to experience something for the first time. And a great way to get that kind of energy back is to go back to basics. Go back to the basic tactics that you did when you were just trying to maybe stumble through that dungeon for the first time. Because that kind of raw energy that you bring to a table is really what makes you valuable to those players who you're telling a story to because it really puts them back in the ground floor of a great adventure. You know, one of the things that I'm concerned about with Dungeons and Dragons in particular is how, you know, it should be a game that everyone feels comfortable picking up. And there's a certain slickness in modern Dungeons and Dragons that I think that might be kind of off putting to people who've never played it before. So pick up the monster manual from first edition. You can probably get it for 15 bucks off of eBay and see how weird, dumb, awkward, and new Dungeons and Dragons was. And I think that might make you feel more comfortable about picking up fifth edition, you know, because you could see it when it was like an awkward teen. <laughs> see it with his first mohawk. Yeah. <laughs> so this was our talk on the Monster Manual. Stu, where can people find you? Every day on Instagram at Vintage RPG. We're posting about role playing games and talking about them and having a good time. Very cool. You can find me on Twitter at Handbreaker. I tweet about professional wrestling. I tweet about Dungeons and Dragons. I tweet about cute animals. You can also find my daily adventures on Instagram, where I'm showing off a lot of things I do behind the scenes at the podcast, as well as my adventures when I actually leave the house, which, you know, it's happened more these days, and I'm pretty excited about it. You can also check out my other podcast, My Tai Happy Hour. It's pop culture for weirdos, wherever podcasts are found. So for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com.